All right, to, I, um, talking to a few of you, the, just wanted to go over some of the some of the concepts, and also uh, you had some questions, and I'll try to go over it and and give you uh, my two two signs vignettes, so to speak, where um, uh, I'll go over some of these um, issues that we've you've been talking about. Okay, I've seen I've shown you this slide maybe five times, but. Uh, a Kamer, okay. I'm, I uh, I don't have the knowledge of Morgan and and Rob in terms of how to name a little bug, but I'm I like maths, so I like Kamers. So if you have a, a, a Kamers, essentially is is uh, if you have a two million base pair genome, and you have a Kamer of twenty one or, or ne any size, a Kamer is two million mi minus one. You'll have you just move along with that window. So you get lots and lots of these cameras, and that's what it's a very uh, useful uh, unit for us. I want to show you two things, how we went about for the study I, I talked to you initially, how to, uh, uh, we uh, gave antibiotics to, to healthy people, basically. And, and, and what we learned from that is, is, is kind of interesting, and we, we haven't finished analyzing all the data, and I just thought about new things, how to do it which I'll tell the students a little later. But in, in essence, the, the, the test was pretty easy. So um, we didn't do 16S because we had enough money to sequence. So uh, essentially, we took uh, some controls, six of them, and 18 people who actually were healthy people who took the antibiotics. And then we took a sample at day zero. Uh, we took a sample at day seven. And day seven was chosen because this is supposed to be essentially the, the peak of where the activity of the uh, antibiotics actually is in terms of suppression. And the paradigm or the, the, you know, how people thought is like 90 days later, you should be okay. Okay, so we took a sample uh, at that point. And then we, we uh, extracted uh, the, stool, the DNA from the stool sample and we sequenced pretty deep, 15 billion nucleotides per sample, just to, to get uh, uh, decent data. One of the first thing we saw, sorry, this just moved a little bit, but these are the controls and these are the exposed, okay? And then they, they paired by three, 0, 7, 90, 0, 7, P for patient, and, uh, and then C for control, and E for exposed. The first thing, if you look at that graph, is like the, the purple is bacteria, I see, so that's, that's good. We had one person that, uh, but if you look, the, the, an the best thing I can say about these types is that an individual is its best control. If you want to do some microbiome research, take one person and follow him. It seems to be uh, a way to do it that's, you can get some data a little easier. Because unless you can do 200, 300, or 400 patients, you'll need that because there's a lot of variability. So sometimes go for the lowest hanging fruit. Think about following people and gives another vector in the analysis. And you can see and most people, if you look by like pairs of three here, or I'm here, <laughs> essentially, they, uh, they look the same. And then some of them went wacky. You know, a couple of them, and that's the person who took uh, iron. She's, she never came back. So I think that's one of the little uh, vignettes here that I wanted to tell you. Just, um, just try to see, uh, uh, you know, if you can add another dimension for analyzing the data, not just zero and one, another vector by giving some time points into it. One of the other um, points is to make is we always have these, uh, these graphs saying, well, uh, uh, these bacteria, uh, they increase while I gave the, the drug, and, and these uh, uh, decrease. And obviously, careful there, is you're moving <laughs> your cursor into the iceberg of sequencing that, that you do, OK? So that's uh, one of the issues. One of the other point is you can see, well, I've shown you this. Uh, it's very uh, dynamic, OK? And normal in terms of microbiome, I think everybody agrees here, normal doesn't exist. So, although by Thursday with the yogurt, maybe you'll feel good. Um, maybe I should, a uh, disclaimer, they, I'm actually, I, I'm doing a study with them. I should have said that. <laughs> but they're, they're not paying me. They're not paying me. Although they gave me some free bio K when I was taking an antibiotic because I wanted to test it. Um, other things that 
cool ways to look at it. The, the paper was looking at what happens if you take an antibiotic. And I'm just asking the medical questions here. If, if you have a very diverse microbiome, are you better off than somebody who doesn't have a, 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 a microbiome uh, that's a little bit more uh, constrained? And then we went and looked at basically the enterotypes, you know? So this bacteriose and prevotella, so we look, okay? And that's the patient who went berserky. And then you could, we could cluster it in terms of similarities, okay? And then you can, that's at the level of enterotype. And then you can start digging down a bit. And then about their microbial diversity. Those are made, measured by Shannon index and all of these types of things, and I won't say OTU to you here. But you have some people had a very high density, the, the cluster here, and some people had a low, uh, low diversity and they clustered here, okay, and here. And then these were a different group because they're very different from the others. Now, that, what was really interesting is that those people who were at lower uh, diversity in this cluster two and three, though some of them, and all of them you can see exposed seven, a lot of them that the lower diversity had this one that's prognostic of not having a good outcome, okay, with diarrhea. Yes? Is this uh, diversity at baseline before antibiotics? Or yeah. Yeah. And I'll come to that. I'll show it to you. So, and when you, when you start counting stuff, okay, you have, uh, we, we could detect, you know, we can screen all these schemers, and this is the level of, of material you've got there in some ways. We found 24,000 mobile elements, so about 340 in each, in each one of us. There's 43,000 uh, resistant genes, about 600. Uh, per sample. That's a lot. And then resistant genes that are next to a mobile element, because the hypothesis, if you're next to a mobile element, maybe you have an easier chance of being transferred, 29. And we find a lot of uh, putative beta lactamates. So in some ways, it goes back to what, be careful of the, what happens. You can make some, uh, all sorts of assumptions, because there's a lot in there, and it's a lot moving in there as well, okay? And then, uh, so when we took this Cefprozil, and we took Cefprozil because that's the only one the ethics committee would allow us to give because it doesn't do much, because I couldn't do give him vancomycin and flush him <laughs> pretty well. But in essence, we, we could see that it had an impact, and that's kind of the puny, uh, puny one. And it was kind of specific, and it was, seemed to be reproducible and also predictable. And then the, the, the thing is that uh, a low diversity, and this is what the questions really we kind of answer it after uh, the study in some ways, but this is uh, the ones that had low diversity had a, a bloom of Enterobacter cloacae, which is not a good phenotype. And then resistant genes that were undetectable before, we saw in two patients, we could actually see the actual gene uh, that's responsible for this resistance. I, won't, I didn't show it to you. So I think this can be generalized to, uh, to a lot of other things. The, um, the way also, can we look a little bit further than taxonomy? And here, this is a plug for, for Maxim, who, who's working on a, on, a, on a software called uh, Ray uh, Surveyor. So we do everything that's called Ray for us, Ray, Ray Meta, Ray Surveyor. And, uh, and, and initially, I thought, uh, it, I think it was insanely great. Is that what I, my quote? Yeah, OK. And I, I still like it. And then you'll be training on it a little bit. So it's not published yet. It will be very soon, and it's obviously available. So we've talked about, you know, when you take a, a, an antibiotics, you, you select one, and, and then everything is, is, is quite interesting. But instead of looking at all of these pathways, could we use the De Bruyne graphs that we had? So we've created a graph of all of the chemos and their relationship, and then we have an, uh, the other one at another time point. Could we do this? And could we compare all these chemers of all these genomes as chemers? You know, who cares about OTUs and all the rest? And can we do, can we cluster them? Uh, we could, and then we could set that up in, in minutes. You'll test that. We can compute distances, and it's not phylogeny tree, but phonetics. So we could actually start uh, looking at this. And, and we can do all sorts of uh, funny statistics, but I'll show you a little bit 
uh, how I'm thinking about how to go ahead with this, go forward with this. So if you look at how the antibiotics affect the metagenomes, <clears throat> so in the control, uh, here's the, uh, uh, the, the essentially kind of the diversity index, and it's about, it's here, an average for the control, and the average for all the people who receive, uh, that were exposed to the antibiotic. Okay, so, it go, so when you give an antibiotic, you start you know, squeezing a little bit the diversity. And then if you look a little later, then you go back a little bit, but not much, not, not totally, okay? And the thing is that, okay, but what did disappear and what's coming up, okay? So in a sense, so you, ha you gain some chemos, okay? So these are, again, control and a patient. So both of them are modulating. This, these people had nothing except time. Okay, they gain different chemos and they lost different ones. So that's just basically how it the variability. If you look when they're treated, they gain some and they lost more. Okay, also. So that's very interesting to me in some ways. And then if you look what happened at day 90, so again, the, about the same chemo gain and loss. And then, but you're starting to gain more chemo. Some things are coming back in terms of just what was there before uh, in, at day 90. And what's interesting, and I, I just thought about that essentially, but we could actually look for functions here. What, what do you lose as a function when you, we give a particular drug or a, or a particular antibiotic? So I'm thinking those lines, so feel free to, to do that if we, if, we, if, we, if we don't do it. And, and same here, what you gain, are you gaining Obviously, you're getting some of the same species back, but not always. I mean, you've, you've changed the, the niche, so I think it's uh, interesting. So now I'd like to, um, to introduce to you a little bit what Ray Surveyor is. Okay, and Ray Surveyor is my, my attempt to try to understand what's happening. And I've failed, but essentially, uh, it's starting to give uh, us a, a very nice picture. Here, I'll show you uh, something. Uh, about antibiotic resistance. And these are all uh, one bug, Clostridium difficile, okay? And then what we did is uh, we sequenced, I've sequenced uh, nearly all the Clostridium difficile in the hospital in Quebec City since 2010. So uh, lots of them, so there's certain hospitals you shouldn't go, and I'll tell you later. And, uh, but if you look al along the, the, these are chemo comparisons. If you look along the, the diagonal, so that's, Essentially, you're identical to, to the other one, okay? This is uh, comparing in terms of chemos. And in, in Canada and also in Quebec, we have one massive strain uh, called NAP1 that's actually uh, antibiotic resistance, and all of these are, are not so antibiotic resistant. So it's a way to see, okay, this is what circulate right now. These are, uh, are the other ones that circulate, but some of them have some resistance, and you can detect little clusters uh, in terms of uh, maybe that's the next strain that's going to happen in a hospital or something like that. So, and then I, I really liked it because it's very, very uh, visual. And then I asked, okay, so now this, this is comparing, it's actually the chemos of the whole genome. So what happens if I compare this graph generated with the whole genome with just the chemos that are associated with resistance? Okay, so I remove everything and just look at chemos associated with resistance. And in essence, this is what it gives you. So you look, this is like Scottish tartans in some ways, but in some ways you can see that for this group, it's in, along this, this group, uh, resistance chemo were important for this group. So it's, it's in, that's normal. I mean, they're, they're resistant. And then within this other big cluster, there was a smaller group that was uh, involved in resistance. So I think that was pretty interesting. So maybe that's the next one we'll have to, to check to see if it's okay. And then you can go a little bit further with this. And we haven't totally validated that. I put that out here because we have time to do it and there's some experts in the room to, to, to shoot holes in there. But uh, so here's Clostridium difficile. Here's the resistance, it seems important. This is mob mobile element. Same, looks like a, and then uh, this is a, a biosynthetic gene cluster. It really doesn't look like this one. Here's the importance of bacteriophage, maybe more here, and here's the, uh, and plasmids. So this is all for uh, sedative, okay? So 
we went a little further with Frédéric and, and Maxim uh, to look basically at uh, Streptococcus pneumoniae and uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa and bacteria. I think there's 2,600 bacteria or so that we use. And we say, OK, let's see how uh, this is the whole genome. So again, you're identical here. You can't read, obviously, all the teeny things because it's 2,600. And Pseudomonas aeruginosa is around 600. And uh, about the same for uh, Streptococcus pneumoniae. So, and then you can look at uh, insertion, uh, uh, it? insertion sequences, and then we can say how much uh, do, how much this looks like this. And so we do the percentage here: six percent, six percent, zero. So it doesn't seem to be important here. Plasmid genes, zero with the f full bacteria, ninety-seven. So resistant genes for Pseudomonas aeruginosa quite important. For the other one, important, but to a certain extent, 28%. And then bacteriophage, you can see the, the percentage that look alike. And then uh, and here, bacteria, plasmids are super important. For so you can practically, if you just take plasmid sequences, they kind of recreate the same graph in here. And here, in terms of plasmids, it's important to Streptococcus pneumoniae. doesn't seem to be important for uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And then, and uh, biosynthetic gene clusters seem to be important for these two, a little less for Streptococcus pneumonia, who's in the human niche uh, nearly all the time. So, not totally sure what it means right now, so let it fester in your mind as well. But um, we went a little bit further and asked ourselves, well, this is the, all the bacteria, <laughs> and then we say, look at mobile elements, uh, resistant gene, bacteriophage plasmids, and biosynthetic gene clusters. And we have all the, uh, the families here. And then you can look what's important for each one of them, just as a whole. So if you look for a bacteriophage, in some ways, you shouldn't look in these. You should look a little bit more in these. And that's, that's, the, that's the way we approach uh, the problem. And in essence, if you look for instance, just, just a bigger because you probably couldn't read it very well, but if you look for a biosynthetic gene cluster, it doesn't seem to be a great deal here, a lot more uh, there. And when we did this tree, we had at least 100, 100 uh, kind of bacteria per, per line. So it's starting to, to do. So it's a, it's a way to look, uh, compare uh, in some ways the uh, the evolution and the importance of these different agents to the evolution of these bacteria, because you actually sequence them, they were alive, and basically that's, that's what we're doing. But we could do any functions here and see how important they are for this particular process. And in some ways, John, maybe we can try it for metatranscriptomic in some ways. So I, it's very early days for this, so, but we'll see how, how it goes. And you'll have a little tutorial to see uh, you're helping us to, to make it better. Uh, before uh, before we release it in some ways. Uh, a little thing I wanted to, to, to talk to you about, and it was uh, brushed a little bit. Uh, so biomarkers, so this morning, Fiona talked about biomarker validation. So there's a lot of them are uh, DNA-based, okay, we know that. A lot of them are bug-based, so, so which bug do you have? But I, I think the problem is that sequencing is not very amenable to to a pipeline in a hospital, because I'm in a hospital. So, so I was trying to look at other ways to do it. And I just want you to think about it. I'm not telling you how to do it in any way, shape, or form. But so these bugs, you know, they produce little molecules, metabolites. And they're the actual effectors. And I think these are the ones we can measure. And we have beautiful instruments to measure this. We have mass spectrometers. We can measure metabolites. Uh, or speci specific bugs that are would be could be a, a basic, basically a, a proxy for for these particular uh, bugs rather than just doing uh, um, uh, sequencing and if and it's really cheap uh, okay the instrument is not cheap but when you run the uh, samples it's pretty cheap and then the last thing I wanted to say is when we're talking about supervised and unsupervised. Um, uh, we like, uh, in this group, we like supervised. The, the, one of the reasons is uh, because it's usually interpretable. And not just supervised, but supervised and parsimonious. So that means they're sparse. And the reason is uh, it's helpful to build your house of cards in your mind. 
It's in the sense that if you have like five, six, if the if the decision, the, the machine learning, and you will dwell on it a lot. If the machine learning tells you four or five stuff, uh, you know, features that are important to make your decision. It's a lot easier to interpret than uh, SVM that will take you know millions every pick you have basically or every feature you have. So we're concentrating on this a great deal. And I'd like to come back, uh, and you'll have plenty uh, in the next uh, day and a half to, to, to either refute what I just said or make your mind that's, that's where you want to go. Um, there's a lot of really cool uh, stuff right now with KBase and also PRISM and, uh, uh, to, to find these metabolites that will help, uh, help us, and also Metasys. Uh, this was a comment on, on Galaxy. Uh, who uses Galaxy here? Okay. Okay, it's, it's okay. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, it's good for the notebook. Uh, uh, Pierre Luc, you use a uh, Galaxy or not? For the, no. no? Okay. Well, you know how to code, so you, you get irritated with GUI and you rather write the code line. But, in some ways, those are these are a couple of projects that are really good for for you, because in some ways uh, it simplifies the, the approach, so you don't have to know too much of uh, command line approaches. And the whole aim of this school was to basically take the one third of computer scientists and the two thirds of biologists and put you. Uh, I don't think one will become the other, and the other, but you'll be at an interface where you'll have a common language, and that'll be very, very useful, for, uh, I think, for all of you guys in your careers. So I'll, um, I'll stop there by showing again the figure of, of the gang, and um, I'll take a couple of questions, and then we should go to our, uh, to our uh, a symposium. Okay, any questions? None? None? Okay.